teaching. How's the weather over there? It's uh, I'm near the sea. Uh, okay. Rambam is it so you can see here uh, the sea oh, from my window. <laughs> so I have an opportunity of having from my window. Actually, it's uh, it's uh, for Israeli uh, standards. It's uh, it's cold these days, but it's uh, <laughs> but okay. it's not bad. And and you are situated in Tel Aviv. I live in Tel Aviv, but the hospital is at Haifa, so it's uh, northern to Tel Aviv, near the sea at the north of Israel. Yeah, Haifa, that's Haifa hi we call, uh, we see it, eh? Haifa, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. And now you're in the hospital, or is uh, it... Yeah, yeah, in the hospital. That's okay. hospital. Okay. So that is a view from my uh, window, adult, my office. Okay. <laughs> I saw Rachelle uh, now also... This, this is a wonderful event for us, for Jay. Yeah, actually, the the device that I present is a, is is an uh, is by an Israeli company, but uh, the the inventor and the CEO of the company uh, is a PhD in neurophysiology. And he's also part Israeli, part Dutch. He has a Dutch nationality. His family, his mother is there, and he has uh, so he has uh, he has uh, close ties with the Netherlands. Oh, wonderful! Is he uh, on board this day to, today as well? Will, he, I will give the lecture. I think he will be able to join. Uh, okay. Uh, and what is his name, please? Iftah Dolev. Iftah. If the, uh, D O L E V, and he did. Uh, he's a neurophysiologist. Did a, his PhD in Tel Aviv and a postdoc at Harvard. And he's the CEO of the company. And he's a very nice okay. guy. He has a Dutch manner, so it's. A... <laughs> okay, uh, I would like to have uh, his contact details uh, later I will, on. I will. Uh, uh, how would I say? I can give you his email, or do you want me to? You can yeah. write it, or I'll send it to you. How do you? Well, we have, we will keep in contact after this okay, so meeting. Okay, yeah. so because this this kind of uh, people are so important for the relation between Israel and the Netherlands. So, okay, he I'll, even speaks a bit Dutch. Not very good, I understand, but he speaks Dutch. So that is wonderful, but. I would okay. like to keep in contact with him. Yeah, with a pleasure. Yeah. He would be happy to. Yeah. Hi, Marco. Marco, good morning. Good morning. We have a few more, uh, like one more minute. If we can just try and see that you can uh, upload your presentation, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I was expecting that that was be done for me, but I can try. All right. And then Avner might also say something about your outline. Um. Marco, good morning. It's Leo from the tech team. If you have any issue with your uh, sharing uh, the presentation, I can do it for you and then you just uh, present it and I will uh, move the slides. Yeah, I prefer that. No problem. Do you want to try it? Yeah, you can try me. Okay, I will share it. Shahar, are you also here? Okay, Marco. I, I, I can only see the directory. Huh? Okay, just On my screen. Second. I don't know how it's without us.
Good morning, everybody. I am Marika Monroy. <laughs> nice to meet you. You can do this here. Yeah, this is okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yep, fine. So uh, when you start, I will uh, start sharing, and then uh, you just need to ask me to change the slide. Yes, that's fine. Marco will be the Thank first speaker. Thank you. Yo, Marco will be the first speaker, okay? Let's yeah, no problem. Um, Move the switch Good morning, goedemorgen, Bokel Tov. I'm very pleased to host our 10th Dutch Israeli Mini Symposium. And today we focus on the very important topic, uh, topic of AI and dementia. This mini symposium is co organized uh, by my colleague Hans Arnold, who uh, will be uh, welcome you soon, and, um, and myself. And uh, I'd like to invite the Deputy Ambassador, uh, Mrs. Monrique, uh, Marike Monroy, to say a few words. And uh, this is our second mini symposium, right, on AI and, uh, and health. And uh, we are making now another move forward, focusing on the field of dementia. Yes. Marike, thank you, uh, Kelly. And uh, thank you uh, all for joining us today. Uh, welcome. Um, um, as Rachel said, I'm the deputy head of mission, and I'm also uh, responsible for the coordination of the economic work uh, of this embassy. Um, now, inside our embassy, we also uh, harbor the Israeli Dutch Innovation Center, the IDIC. And uh, this innovation center has an advisory board, and we are very proud to have on this advisory board uh, Dr. Efrat uh, Schaffer, uh, uh, who is the president of uh, Philips in Israel and also uh, Dr. Ken Sarif, who is co-founder and co-CEO of uh, Deep Pathology Limited. Uh, now, both uh, companies are known to be uh, very active in the field of artificial intelligence and health. Um, now, also in our embassy, we foster research and development cooperation between our two countries. Um, we organized in 2021, a series of Dutch-Israeli mini symposia on different topics, including health and AI. So let's talk about AI a bit more. Um, in the last couple of years, there has been a lot of advancement in the field of artificial intelligence in the Netherlands. Now, first of all, the Dutch Artificial Intelligence Coalition or the Dutch AI Coalition was set up. And this is a very interesting coalition where uh, the government, uh, companies, uh, business sector, um, but also educational and research institutions, as well as the civil society are participating. And the ambition is to position the Netherlands at the forefront of knowledge and application of artificial intelligence for prosperity and well-being. Now, also Israel has organized uh, artificial intelligence uh, events in the Netherlands, for instance, a global AI conference in Amsterdam in which leading Israeli speakers gave uh, plenary lectures. Um, and furthermore, um, there was also a uh, giant, um, I don't know if I pronounce it well, set up by Hans Arnold, but he will correct me uh, because he will uh, elaborate a bit more on this topic uh, after uh, a few minutes. Now, in Israel, the digital health started developing uh, over 20 years ago, and it received another boost when Israel set up its cyber security agenda to protect critical infrastructure. And a couple of years ago, Israel issued its national AI agenda, aimed at building on the success story of cybersecurity, and they try to achieve now similar results in the AI domain. Now we see potential for Israel and the Netherlands to work together in this field. And uh, we would like to point out the possibility that uh, the Horizon Europe uh, program may be used as a, uh, as a possible way to fund uh, innovative projects. 
So I wish you all a very fruitful symposium. And I hope uh, you will learn a lot and that will inspire you for more joint R&D cooperation. So thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you so much, Marike. And um, as I said, this uh, mini symposium was co-organized with Hans Arnold. Uh, I will call you Hans because we also became friends um, during the last couple of months. Uh, Hans is an independent in, uh, entrepreneur and he develops with stakeholders new business opportunities, validated business models, and program plans. He used to work with large and complex organizations, and he's most confident in environments where international projects with multidisciplinary uh, teams must be realized. And I really think that this is uh, one of such examples. And therefore, uh, Hans, you are also very excited about uh, the cooperation between Israel and the Netherlands. Hans, the floor is yours. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, dear all, good morning. Uh, I'm happy to see so many people on the screen. I hope you can follow the conference all very well. Uh, as a representative of Jane, I warmly welcome everybody. Uh, the relationship with Israel is so good that I would like to mention that as very important. Uh, Israel is for us uh, the worldwide front runner in our effort to work together globally and to bring the affordable products to people with dementia worldwide. This is very important. Affordable products that assist people with dementia in maintaining their quality of life as long as possible and to keep the care for them and their carriers as long as possible as sustainable and payable. Uh, that's where my introduction and I would like to give the word and to our honorable friend and chairman Rachelli. Rachelli, please, you. the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to have a very interesting uh, and hopefully also at the end of the program an interactive program and I will start by uh, introducing our first speaker uh, Marco Blom who is the scientific director of the Alzheimer Nederland, Alzheimer Society in the Netherlands He's a psychogerontologist, and since 1987, he is involved in organizations and projects on dementia. He was involved in the development of the Alzheimer Cafes, the Academic Alzheimer Research Centers, and the online platform www.dementia.nl. Um, other affiliations of Marco are being a board member of the Delta Plan uh, Dementia, the National Program on Dementia in the Netherlands between 2013 and 2020. And uh, Marco is a board member of Alzheimer's Europe since 2018. And uh, I welcome Marco as our first speaker. Thank you, Rachelie and Hans, uh, for the kind introduction and lengthy introduction, I must say. Um, um, my introduction is more or less a kickoff of this symposium, I think, and I will uh, underpin the urgency to deliver uh, products for people with dementia and their carers and call for a worldwide cooperation. Can I have the first slides? Yeah, and as you said, uh, I work at uh, Alzheimer Netherlands for almost 25 years. And maybe good to say that we are a combination of a health fund and a patient organization. And in the combination of these two tasks, we, we try to do the best effort we can for people with dementia and their carers. And uh, next slide, please. So if I will. In my short presentation, I will give you some figures and figures on uh, dementia as a public health priority. I will have lent all the information from the WHO report, which uh, was published a few years ago. And I will concentrate on who is affected, what are the costs, and the action areas and targets of this WHO program, and then see that it very well gets along with our uh, endeavor for making products available for people with dementia. And next slide. So what you can see that uh, when, the, when the report was published, there were almost 47 million people with dementia estimated to be worldwide. And the growth was to be uh, to 75 million in 2030. We are almost there, I would say. 
and uh, halfway this century, the, the numbers will grow to 132 million people with dementia. It's beyond imagination, uh, these, these numbers. Um, and and we, we need to take into account that every three seconds, a new dementia patient is added to this number of on this still growing number. So the, they estimated that one 10 million new cases every year uh, diagnosed with dementia. Um, and this is because there are more elderly in every society throughout the world. And especially because the onset of dementia is on average above 75 or sometimes even above 80 years. This has to do with the uh, uh, graying of the society and the world, I would say. And it, it's also been caused by the fact that survival rates are coming higher and higher in the treatment of cancer and heart diseases. So we are getting older and we don't die from other uh, diseases. So dementia is more, more prevalent in the late stages. And what I would stress is that the majority of people who will develop dementia will be in the low and middle income countries. So in the Western and more developed countries, the number will double. But in the other countries uh, throughout the world, it will triple or even, um, even more. Next slide, please. And the costs of dementia are also estimated, and it's it's uh, it's about to raise to two trillion U.S. dollars by 2030. Also, this is a, a number that's beyond imagination, I would say. Um, but I would like to stress that um, these costs are related to staffing and home care and residential facilities. So you could expect that um, the quality of care will not be able to be on this this level we have now because the short of staff will be tremendous i think we don't have two uh, we don't have these numbers of people who are able to work and care and there's also been medical treatments are available between now and several years but they will cause a raise and, and they will cause a raising cost when they become available so it will be more expensive than uh, than expected and the, the most important thing is that the care, the costs of care are more or less driven by families and friends because they are available. They lower the cost of uh, the, the care facilities. Next slide. So what the, the, the WHO did was they um, identified seven areas for, um, for, for action. And I think um, the, the below, the, the tree below, it's support for dementia carers, information system for dementia, and the research and innovation part are especially of interest to, to our endeavor here. Um, the first four themes are more or less uh, recognizing dementia as a public health priority, which should be uh, available in every uh, country, a, a dementia plan or a strategy in place. Um, the society should become more uh, aware of dementia and more dementia friendly. And speaking about the numbers of people with dementia, there's a high um, promise set by uh, risk reduction programs, which will be able to postpone the age of which uh, dementia will be prevalent. So instead of 75, maybe 70, 78 uh, years on average. And that would be very cost uh, cost reducing. And the biggest problem, I think, the, the WHO uh, identified was the fact that dementia, in some countries, more than 50% of the patients have not a diagnosis of dementia. So they are more or less left alone and, and not, not available for their uh, for care uh, treatments. Next slide. So what I would say is that um, technical solution should address the needs of family carers because they are uh, the ones who are really um, supporting the care for the for the people with dementia. They should replace or support the work of professional care because they will become scarce and scarce and even more scarce in the next few uh, years. And I think more developed countries have an obligation to implement that knowledge and solutions on a global level. So we're not doing this for our own country or the Western world, but we do it for the whole world, I would say. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Marco. Uh, you definitely uh, showed us that there is an urgency to deliver products for people with dementia and your call for a worldwide cooperation was well received. Our um, second speaker will be Professor Yaniv Asaf from the Department of uh, Neurobiology uh, from Tel Aviv University. Asaf is a neuroscientist and a biophysicist. He has a joint postdoctorate fellowship from Tel Aviv uh, Suraski Medical Center and NIH. And in his postdoc, uh, Professor Asaf investigated different aspects of neuronal white matter mapping with MRI, including implementation um, of neuronal white matter map, ah, sorry, investigated different aspects of neuronal white matter mapping with MRI, including implementation, um, um, white, sorry, I'm getting, in multiple sclerosis, sclerosis, stroke, and dementia. At Tel Aviv University, Professor Asaf focuses on developing MRI techniques and analysis frameworks that will enable indirect measurement of micron scale structures throughout through low resolution MRI. His current research uh, includes the characterization of the assembly of neuronal networks to produce micron and submicron fiber bundles, fundal map mappings throughout the brain and imaging the local arrangement of cellular structures in a cortical gray matter layers and their relation to the functional anatomy of the human brain. Asaf, the floor, uh, Yaniv, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for, the, for the introduction. I would also add that uh, aside from my academic duties, I'm also the co-founder and CTO of Green Vivo, which is, uh, uh, wishes to, uh, to, 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 to establish a brain-based AI environment that may help the aging population, but also others. But today I want to speak about MRI of the aging brain and our research uh, around it. And uh, I want to thank you for the invitation for this uh, wonderful forum. All right, I, I will start with, with saying that the, the relationships between the brain and, 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 and physics, the brain as a wonderful machine it may be, still needs to work under the laws of physics. It needs to work under the conservation of mass and under the conservation of energy as anything in, in, in our universe. And we do know that the, the mass of the brain, its weight reduces over time, over, over the aging. And we do know that as a consequence of that, also its energy and, and its output, the behavior also reduces or deteriorates over, over age. And it's not something that we didn't know for a very long time now. It's Santiago Ramonica Hall said in his book from 1909 that, that the brain needs to, needs everything in the brain, all the connections, all the, all the neurons have to be adapted and governed by the laws of conservation for time, space, and material. And time is a critical factor in conservation of, of, of brain ability to perform uh, to perform uh, uh, its processes and with time also the process of aging. And we do know that the brain mass reduces over time. In this image, what you can see here is a correlation with the age of over 100 subjects aged between 21 and 92 from our database. And the red areas shows regions in the brain where the volume volume of, of these areas in the brain reduces through age. And you can see that it is widespread around the, around the brain, but with, with few uh, focal regions that are more affected. For example, you can see in, 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 the, in the middle side, uh, you can see the, the hippocampal regions or the medial temporal lobe that are mostly affected and also the frontal areas, which may have influences or our cognitive abilities. The question is how can we first understand these changes uh, in brain mass and how it affects our behavior, and maybe more importantly, how we can uh, uh, challenge those and, and try to, the, to, to, to minimize them or even stop them in there. For that, we need to come out with some formula to understand aging. So we can say that aging is a function of many factors of our brain physiology, uh, which will be obviously related to genetics, uh, which we have no control on, uh, could be related to heredity, uh, which we also have no control on, uh, could be a function also the environment of where we, where we live and, and, and our lifestyle. We have some control of, of, of that. Some people may relocate their life, as most people will stay around the place they were born. And also it would be a function of life habits. And here really is something that we can control on because we know that there are many recommendations for the aging population on how to make 
make their lives better. We should eat healthier food, right? This is the most, the most important, uh, the most important recommendation. Don't eat fat. Eat good fat because now we know that some of, some of the fats are good for us. Don't eat carbohydrates. Don't drink alcohol. Drink alcohol moderately. Don't smoke. Don't use cannabis. Cannabis is good for the elderly. Solve puzzles. Sudoku. Do sports. Don't overdo sports, etc. So we know that there is a lot of, of, of recommendation that that may come to the elderly population. Some of them are contradicting and are confusing, and that that's because that for each one of the of us, different aspects of this recommendation will work better than the others. And we need to make it subject specific or person specific, you know, to say what will benefit our brain and eventually the body uh, from, from our life habits or lifestyle. And the idea is to create some graph like that, that we can, we can uh, uh, scan a subject at young, young age of, of 30, 40, 50, 60, and say what is the likelihood for him to age better or, or worse, and, and to predict that through machine learning, through artificial intelligence and try to and, and try to, to, to give some recommendation how we can shift this uh, this uh, prediction higher uh, so it will become better aging at the end. So the hypothesis we have a bit behind this uh, this project is that brain imaging can provide better understanding for the aging process and its interaction with well-being and other individual factors. And everything needs to be individualized at the end because the aging of one subject can, can't tell us anything about the aging of another subject. And why the brain is different from, from other parts of the body. We, we know what is what aging causes the liver, the kidneys, the lungs, the heart. And there are a lot, a lot of good, as, as was said in the previous presentation, there are good solutions for that uh, in relation to aging. And we, we can preserve most of them in good shape. But what about the brain? We don't know about the much about it we know we know a lot about the brain but there is a lot more that we don't know and 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 aside for that we don't know much about why the why the brain ages as it does and why it affects some individuals in one way and others in another and I want to introduce you some factor that is called the brain connectome. The brain connectome is one of the features of the brain that become very popular in the last the last 20 20 and so years, and, and it seems to provide a more holistic view of the brain that may be a very good candidate to understand the relation between brain and aging. So we want to understand also in aging the relation between brain function and behavior at the end. We know about the structure of the brain, gray matter, white matter, we know genetics, we know all the different components of the brain, all the different cells, but in the intermediate level between all of them lies the connectome. The connectome is the mass array of all connections that we have in the brain that form the dense network between all components of the nerv nervous system. It spans along many dimensions. We can think of a connectome of a single neuron, of a region in the brain, and of the entire brain. And then the end, it will be a map or a graph. And we do now, uh, we do now uh, uh, there are very strong evidences in the literature that the connectome, uh, its, its topology and, and how it forms affects our cognition and behavior, also in aging. And some people would say that as genes encode our body, the connectome may encode our mind. So what is the connectome research? Uh, connectome research is something that is done in neuroscience for, for, for decades. Uh, the first connectome was developed for the C. elegans, which is a very small uh, worm, a small uh, uh, animal, uh, having 302 neurons, and you can see its connectome over here. Uh, following that, uh, they, they mapped the, the connectome of the drosovila, of the, the, of the fly, uh, which you can see over here. And now there are many attempts, uh, especially in Europe, uh, to map the connectome of, uh, of the mouse brain in the, in the human connectome, uh, in the human brain project and the, and the blue brain project to map it. And there are a lot of successes. I just heard a few weeks ago that they were able to map 10 million neurons of the mouse brain. But the problem, the scalability of the problem becomes very, uh, very difficult when, when you think of the human brain, which has 100 billion neurons uh, to map. 
Like don't research read MRI. I can uh, we we can map MRI with uh, with neuroimaging imaging that allows us not not to perform the the con not to uh, not to map the connection of every single neuron and every single synapse in the brain, but but to get a more global view of 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 the connectome. And this is done with a method called diffusion MRI. Without going into the technical details of the method, it just measures the motion of water molecules, as we can see in this uh, short animation, and you can see that in different parts of the neurons and hence in different parts of the brain, you see different kinds of motions. For example, within this connection, uh, this long axon or, or neural fibers that connects different, different brain areas, you will see a diffusion that is more like an ellipse. And we can actually map map that uh, through MRI and can jump into the brain and, and create its connection. As you can see here, when we are passing from one side of the brain to the other side of the brain, when we do it globally over the entire tissue, we, we can create these kind of images which give us a global view of the connectivity of the brain. And through that, we can ask our, create, our question how this connectivity and at the end, the connectivity is the one that creates our behavior and function, function how this connectivity relates to cognitive abilities and in aging. Analysis of this kind of information can be done through the graph theory. So the graph theory is a very long, old, uh, uh, um, a, a, a long pro, uh, pro, uh, procedure in mathematics uh, envisioned by Leonard Euler in Kroningberg. Um, and, and in the brain, what we do is we take all the connection and just transform them into a matrix that gives us a map which brain areas are connected with other brain areas. And through that, we know the topology, topology of the brain and can extract some, a lot of information about the efficiency of the connectivity and, and the central areas of connectivity in the brain, et cetera. And through that, we can, then, can, can create these kinds of maps that, that maps that shows us where are the central hubs in the brain, where, where are the areas that are more efficiently connected or are hubs of, of several other connections with other regions that are, are loosely connected. And we can get this information also in aging. We also know, so here you can see on, on the left side, you can see the, the, the hubs of connectivity in the brain uh, by a work by, by Bullmore. And, and just to put it alongside uh, this, uh, this map of amyloid deposition, the, the positions that we know that happens in aging and in Alzheimer's disease, and you can see a very, very close resemblance between the areas that are highly connected in the brain to the areas that have amyloid deposition. While, while it's very difficult to uh, um, uh, to measure amyloid deposition over the entire population, to measure diff this diffusion imaging connectivity maps, it's quite easy. The acquisition of that kind of information can take about three minutes, and you can get very rich information about that connectivity that may tell us something, something about the physiology behind it. And this is what we have done in our project. So Tel Aviv University has established an aging and plasticity brain bank. We don't have a good name for it so far, but it's a long name, but, uh, but we created in this bank already more than 400 subjects that were scanned. You can see it was very difficult through the corona period to get the people at old age, but they are getting closer. I hope that the fifth wave of the corona will not stop them coming. So we get this information and scan uh, scan subject and, and, and still counting every day more and more subjects are uh, volunteering for this project. And what we have seen, as you can see here, that, that when we look at one of the parameters of, of, of the graph topology, of the connectivity topology, which is the degree, how much each area is connected to any other area, we can see that the correlation in this Manhattan plot, we can see some correlation with aging in, uh, in, in several areas in the brain. For example, this is of the subcortical nuclei in the brain that are correlated with age, and the degree just reduces, just reduces. So we, we, we uh, some of the connection of these areas with other brain areas re reduces with age. And we can do it for other factors, for other regions in the brain, and we can, we can actually monitor which areas and which regions are more closely uh, to be related or correlated with age-related cognitive decline. And once we have enough people in our database, we will able also to pinpoint which cognitive decline is related to, bring, to which region and how that is, interacts with aging at the end. 
And lastly, the one thing that 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 once our database will be larger and will will be of about uh, more than ten thousand people, we'll be able to do prediction. And this is just an example for that. So we took the brain samples of our subject and tried to see if we can create a model, a machine learning model that will be able to predict from the MRI what uh, is the is the brain age of the subject compared with his real uh, real age. So this is on the y axis is the predicted age. And, and on the x-axis is the real the real age of the subject. And you can see that there are differences uh, to the left and to the right. So some people that are predicted to be younger than the real age, so their brain is younger than that. This is the good side. This is what we, we want to have. And some people, we want to be on this side. And some people that are predicted to be older than the age they are. And we need to understand what are the processes that caused the brain connectivity to look as if it's older than that. And through that information, I think we will be able to understand and what are the factors in our daily living that affect healthier uh, uh, brain connectivity at old age? With that, I would like to thank uh, to end and thanks my collaborator, first Professor Heidi Johansenberg for Oxford University, which we work together on this project uh, by uh, uh, through a connection in the British Council, and uh, my student Gal Bensvi and Aubrey Tomer that have worked on this project and other people in the lab. And I want to thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jenny, for your excellent presentation. And I would like now to introduce our second speaker, Professor Dr. Weinand Eiselstein. Um, Professor Weinand Eisenstein is a has background in artificial intelligence and cognitive neuropsychology. Since the year 2012, he serves as a full professor of cognition and effect in human technology interaction at the Technical University of Eindhoven. His work focuses on enhancing human learning, communication, health, and well being, and improving quality of life for people living with dementia. He is also a, a scientific board member of the Eindhoven AI Systems Institute, AZ, and he has published over 250 uh, academic papers. Professor Eiselstein will tell us about artificial intelligence and the challenges of living with dementia, an interdisciplinary multi-lab approach to design warm smart, smart care solutions. Thank you so much, Kelly, and also thanks uh, to Hans for organizing this. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so within this uh, esteemed uh, company, um, I'll, um, I'll start sharing my slides. Maybe you can give a quick heads up if you can see them. Are they full screen for you? Yes, they are. All right, You're thanks. Great. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'd like to highlight the opportunities of AI uh, in dealing with the challenges of living with dementia, but also I would like to highlight our approach to um, to involving technology uh, in creating or enhancing quality of life for people with uh, living with dementia. Um, part of what I do is 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 uh, part of uh, uh, the expertise center dementia and technology uh, that we have at at TU uh, Eindhoven, which is also a collaboration with Alzheimer Nederland. Uh, and some of the ideas that are in this presentation also emerged from a collaboration called Qualit. It's a consortium that we have formed um, to look at technological products, especially AI um, uh, infused products, uh, for people for enhancing quality of life for people living with uh, dementia. Um, and some of the partners are here today, including Jane, Vilance, and Alzheimer Nederland. Um, so the problem um, we try to address, let's say the, the central challenges, is of course to address real needs um, of people living with dementia. And this is not trivial because fairly often um, needs are formulated of pe uh, by people around the people living with dementia. So one of our key notions is to, to work in a person-centered way, which means that we really want to interact with the people with dementia themselves uh, and have their needs front and center of all our innovation efforts. Um, and we want to do this in a way that makes a substantial difference, of course, to their quality of life and, of course, care efficiency. Um, and we do this whilst respecting the values of these groups, including privacy, dignity, uh, self-worth, etc., both during our research process, but also with our proposed uh, innovations. And one could say that even the value of autonomy and, and staying um, connected to life itself is an ethics value in itself that is driving our, our work. 
Um, as said, we want to make use of, of smart technologies, uh, especially AI, and I will, I will go into that in a, in a, in a, in a second. Uh, but we also want to be um, humble in acknowledging that AI is not a panacea, right? It's not a solution to everything, neither is technology in general. So we, we really uh, also realize that. And we want to develop solutions that have a lasting impact on the lives of people. Um, and this is also a big challenge because we see that uh, many technologies, many smart technologies are being developed without them having a real impact um, in the in the daily lives or in the care practices. Um, and this is known as the uh, infamous uh, implementation gap, which we also try to Address. So, uh, if you think about our efforts as a, a, as a metaphoric bridge, we are between two worlds. We are between the world of the people living with dementia within the context of care and the world of AI and technology. And those two worlds don't typically talk a lot um, with each other. Uh, people in dementia care do not have a, a good understanding of what's possible technologically. And at the same time, people in AI, certainly people that I work with at the Eindhoven University of Technology, do not generally have a good understanding of what it's like to have dementia or to live with a person with dementia. Um, so we need to build a bridge between those two worlds. And this is actually what we're trying to do with our center and with our project. Uh, and this is built on two uh, key ideas. One is co-creation. We need a multidisciplinary approach to address this problem. M multiple disciplines, including technology, design, care professions, uh, implementation sciences, ethics, etc. And we need co-design approaches. And by co-design, we mean designing with the people who are the stakeholders, the primary stakeholders, people living with dementia, as well as their, uh, as the, as their carers. So why AI? This is maybe the key question for today. Um, I think I will, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here, I feel, but AI is, of course, a very powerful technology when it's uh, applied in very specific realms. Um, and it, it has the opportunity or the ability to learn um, certain uh, patterns within behavior, for instance, and certain aberrations of those patterns. So it can also have a diagnostic function when you understand how a pattern might be uh, disturbed and might indicate uh, a deviation of behavior that might indicate um, Alzheimer's, onset of Alzheimer's, for instance. Um, it can be adaptive in various ways. It can be adaptive over time. Uh, it can be adaptive to persons, to per, kind of a personalized uh, type of technology, and it can be adaptive to different contexts. And importantly, AI is, can be a predictive technology. It learns from historic data, um, but it can predict future uh, events to occur, perhaps also um, uh, escalation or uh, increased need for some, some kind of an intervention. But these are all reasons why to use AI. Um, I mentioned also that we would like to do this in a, in a co-design fashion. Uh, and why is that? Well, co-design is basically the approach of actively involving stakeholders, including people with dementia, um, throughout the design process. So not just at the start or at, towards the end to evaluate the proposition, but continuously in an iterative fashion, um, you know, having in the idea generation, in prototype development, in the first testing, in second testing, etc. And it really gives a voice to the needs um, of the person with dementia into better and more relevant solutions that really fits their lived experience. I already mentioned that the needs expressed by people with dementia are somewhat different from needs expressed via other stakeholders. So it's really important to also give the voice to people with, uh, with dementia themselves. And co-design helps us avoid uh, a kind of a tech first approach, a tech push approach. So many projects that I'm aware of are actually taking um, technology and technological abilities as their point of departure. They say, okay, we have robots, what can robots do in care? Rather than what are the needs that are uh, emerging in, in the experience of care to that maybe fit a robot as a solution. Um, and we, we, we use situated and community-based approaches to co-design, which also help us understand the larger social physical context of, of, of these uh, innovations. And in the end, I think co-design enhances creativity and yields better, more relevant systems and services with a higher chance of real uptake and use and, and lasting uh, positive effects. Um, last year, we introduced a concept, a new concept called warm technology. Um, and this is to uh, contrast with, let's say, the more functional medical approaches to, to uh, alleviating some of the 
care burden that, um, that living with dementia can bring. Um, we want to focus on actually what is possible, what people still can do and want to do, the wealth of um, skills and experiences that they bring. Uh, and our focus is also on social and emotional needs. So to enhance feel good moments uh, and, and, and really also be personally empowering. Um, technology that's non-intimidating, highly user-friendly, uh, but also non-stigmatizing. Many of the sort of medical solutions also have a, a stigma associated with them that many people with dementia actually quite dislike. Um, and we want to acknowledge the rich diversity uh, uh, of people uh, in old age, also people living with dementia, uh, and personalized designs so that people can express themselves through their multisensory abilities uh, and, and also recognize um, the world they are, they are offered through technology by including their personal histories, context, and preferences. Um, well, as I said, this requires interdisciplinary collaboration. And first and foremost, of course, collaboration with the people with dementia and their care networks themselves so that, that they can have an active role in need formulation, talk about their lived experiences, um, give us a good idea of what the patient journey is like from, from let's say, the first diagnosis up until um, high care situations, um, but also care itself, the care profession, pr practitioners, nursing sciences, geriatrics, neurology, uh, movement sciences, you name it. And of course, people with technology backgrounds, eh? people in AI, data science, sensor networks, natural language programming, machine learning, etc. Um, and to bridge those worlds huh, between, let's say, the person living with the dementia and care, and on the one hand, and technology on the other hand, we need co-design skills. Uh, and this is, you know, very much embodied in, in, in industrial design, also in human factors work, uh, and usually requires uh, qualitative methods of, 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 um, of needs formulation and evaluation. And all of this is also driven, but also constrained by, um, by ethical considerations and by considerations of, um, of making products that matter, that have a real impact in, uh, in the world. Um, so with our consortium, um, we are trying to do all this, uh, and it's a big um, 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 ambition that we have. And of course, this is a Dutch consortium, and as, uh, as um, um, the introduction uh, uh, already mentioned, um, and there is the Horizon program, and we're in an international community right now. So, you know, there's a lot of room to uh, levitate these ideas to a European level and take on this challenge uh, jointly as an international community. The challenge of delivering person centered, AI powered um, products and systems and services that really enhance quality of life for people living with dementia and their carers. Um, Quality team, we're really proud to have a very multidisciplinary, inclusive team uh, in the sense that we have a, a, a large uh, consortium of academics uh, and also uh, um, institutes of applied academia. Uh, we have patient representation, uh, amongst others, through Alzheimer's in the Netherlands, but also through uh, various care uh, organizations. And we have, of course, organizations that are also specialized in implementation. For instance, Vilans and Henke Herma will be talking in a minute uh, uh, from their perspective, but also insurance companies like CZ and VGZ. Um, so we're really proud to do this together. Uh, and of course, our start is in the Netherlands. I would really also like you to see this as an invitation to collaborate with us on a, on a European level, because I feel we need to work together to make um, quality of life uh, 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 a reality uh, for people living with dementia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wijnand. And we will take your last sentence as uh, an action item in order to uh, really create these collaborations through the Horizon Europe um, calls for proposals. Our next speaker is from the Rambam Medical uh, Center, uh, Professor David Tane. Uh, I'd like to introduce you. Professor Tane serves as the president of the Israel Neurological Association. He's a professor of neurology and he directs the Stroke and Cognition Institute at the Rambam Healthcare Campus. He has initiated reperfusion therapy for acute ischemic stroke in Israel established a dedicated stroke unit, a neurovascular ultrasound lab, and stroke prevention clinics. He has published over 250 scientific peer-reviewed publications and serves on the editorial board of the journal Stroke, and his major areas of interest are stroke, vascular cognitive impairment, 
dementia and Alzheimer's disease, novel technologies, and brain health. And uh, you will tell us more about Delphi, the direct non-invasive brain networking electrophysiology for the evaluation of brain health. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure of being here and joining this uh, Dutch-Israeli mini symposium. Actually, I will add to the introduction that uh, I present the data of the Delphi system uh, by the Quantal X neuroscience uh, company from Israel. And my good friend, the founder and the CEO of the company is actually a Israeli Dutch citizen, has a dual citizenship and has an immediate family in the Netherlands. So he's very excited about uh, uh, these data presented in this symposium. So we can go forward also from what uh, Yaniv Asaf, another good friend of mine, talked about aging of the brain and about the connectome. And we can speak here about a tool that uh, helps us to look at the function of the brain uh, physiologically. It's not a imaging of picture of the brain, but of the function of the brain. And I think it adds a lot of uh, uh, added information. So it's direct electrophysiological imaging. Uh, you can look at it as a kind of a sophisticated ECG of the brain. So it non-invasively probes brain function with the uh, magnetic focused magnetic stimulation and the electrophysiological recording, providing reliable, objective, quantifiable, automatic information related to neuronal activity, connectivity, plasticity. It looks actually at TMS evoked potentials at TEPS. So the, the, the system is very simple, easy to use. So you put an electrode cap, you, me you measure motor threshold, actually you have six electrodes, uh, three places of uh, TMS, uh, three in one side and three in the other side, uh, frontal, parietal and occipital. You evaluate the, the system automatically, evaluates the brain response uh, and, uh, and uh, does the analysis and produces uh, uh, an automatic uh, report. So actually you ping at different places with a magnetic stimulator, you uh, record uh, and you analyze it and, uh, and, and uh, see the results of the specific indicators that are assessed by this system. Uh, so um, you can look here at an example of a normal response and an example of an abnormal response. So it actually magnetically induces brain response in the brain's physiological signature, like a cardiac ECG. Uh, and uh, for example, in here you see a, a very different abnormal response and you can look at it at uh, several indicators. One of them is the waveform adherence, which is the total brain response adherence score to normal response. And it indicates network connectivity, white matter integrity, and the functionality in, in transmitting the electrical response. So the adherence in this wave is, is uh, very abnormal, as you can see, compared to the normal wave. You can see also the area under the curve, which is the total amplitude of the brain response. It's above zero and it indicates overall brain excitability and decreases with age. And you could look at short-term plasticity the ability of the network to reflect changes in the relation between excitation and inhibition and both waveform adherence and short-term plasticity are by scores that are normalized between uh, minus one and one. Also in the study, we look at uh, MRI to compare that to, to white matter, uh, gray and white matter using uh, standard tools of fractional anisotropy and mean diffusibility from tensor derived measures. So for example, you can see here the true functional anisotropy and the predicted functional anisotropy by the Delphi system uh, in different areas in the frontal uh, coronary radiata, frontal occipital fasciculus, and you see 
the very high correlation between the two and the high area under the curve, both in patients after stroke and both in patients after TBI. And actually, the FDA uh, is very, as us, as I, I am, very excited about these uh, findings and has already decided to grant it a breakthrough designation medical device. And that's the indication of use that is still in process, but will be for the system indicated for use in patients suspected of cognitive impairment that can progress to stroke or dementia. It measures uh, TAPS, as I said, uh, and aid in the identification of the presence of structural or functional brain deficits that are indicative of progression to stroke or dementia, looking at brain health or deviation from uh, brain health. The system has a CE mark and the company is obviously um, happy to, to do uh, academic collaborations. So I can show you here uh, analysis with a certain group of patients of healthy controls, patients with subjective cognitive decline that have symptoms, but their cognitive evaluation is still within normal limits patients with a mild cognitive uh, impairment in memory, amnestic MCI, and patients that are uh, demented. So we have here uh, four groups of patients. Here we can see some of their cognitive assessment performed by a computerized cognitive testing by a Neurotrax uh, company. So you can see here memory, you can see uh, executive function, attention, and information processing speed. And you can see in green, healthy controls. In red, dementia, which are all uh, uh, low, obviously. In blue, you can see subjective cognitive decline, which is still within normal limits, although by group, it may be a bit lower, but, but per person, it's still within individual uh, normal limits. And patients with uh, MCI, where you can see decrease mainly in the memory. So here is sophisticated analysis of the gray matter volume by T1 from MRI. And even by sophisticated analysis of the gray, uh, um, gray matter, you can see differences between patients, uh, healthy controls and dementia or subjective cognitive decline and dementia, but it's not sensitive to show differences between healthy controls and subjective cognitive decline. And there are some mild differences with MCI, mainly in the insula and the uh, hippocampus. If we look at uh, white matter fib fibers by fractional anisotropy, it's more, much more sensitive. You can see differences already in different uh, uh, tracts, as you can see here, between healthy controls and subjective cognitive decline and subjective controls and MCI and dementia. However, between patients uh, with subjective cognitive decline, MCI or dementia, there is no deterioration anymore. So it has its value, uh, but it needs obviously sophisticated analysis to get these measures. And if we look at increase in mean diffusivity, we can see also some differences that are between the different groups. You can see here marked in yellow, the more significant ones, but they're, they're in certain tracts, not in others, and they're not as consistent as you can see. And here you can see the results of the of Delphi, direct telephysiological imaging. It takes about 20 minutes of recording. The subject does not have to collaborate or do anything. He just lies. He can be awake or sleep. Uh, and you can see the healthy controls, subjective cognitive decline, MCI, and dementia for the three indicators that I mentioned of the waveform adherence, the area under the curve, and the short-term plasticity. And you can see that you, uh, you can see differences already in patients with subjective cognitive decline, um, that their cognitive, if you do an annual cognitive assessment, as often people may in certain groups may do, you won't see any difference yet, uh, but patients have, a, have, have a symptoms. But if you do Delphi, you can see already uh, uh, changes in, in functional electrophysiology of the brain. And you can see 
with area under the curve and with short-term plasticity. So we think we have here a, a good tool with a lot of opportunities to look uh, on the function of the brain, uh, rather on the anatomy of the brain, and to add more information on the function of the brain. It is related very much to cerebral small vessel disease, which is a very important part of uh, of uh, brain health and the uh, risk of stroke and dementia. And if you can see some things with great matter and white matter, uh, if we'll uh, look with a, with a physiological imaging, we can see early changes that can help us single out and say, well, something is abnormal here. We can uh, do more tests and we can do much more preventive measures because we, we detected early and not when it's uh, too late already. And as a neurologist, I see often patients that their brain is already so sick and it's too late and they ask me, what can I do? But it's uh, uh, the time to prevent cerebral small vessel disease and stroke is much earlier. So we think such a system can be part of assessment of, uh, of, uh, of uh, health uh, and, and uh, assess if there is a if patient is a, if subject is healthy and return to periodic review, or if there is something abnormal, uh, to do additional tests and to improve uh, uh, prevention of uh, of cerebrovascular disease and uh, stroke and dementia. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for your presentation. And um, this brings us to our next speaker, whom I would like to introduce, <coughs> Dr. Hank Hermann Lapp, uh, who is an expert on e-health at Vilans, a member of the board of the International Society of Giro Giron Technology. Vilans is the leading expertise center uh, on long-term care in the Netherlands. Um, Hank has also, Hank, sorry, works at the Technical University of Eindhoven and Smart Homes in multiple EU development projects on e-health, seniors and gaming, fall prevention and detection, interoperability and integrated care. He currently works as a project coordinator and senior researcher in innovation and research, specifically in the field of e-health and long-term care policies. And Hank, you will tell us more about the solution market failure and togetherness israel and the netherlands which is really great because uh, we are not only sharing knowledge uh, but we would like also to strengthen the collaboration between israel and the netherlands so hank the floor is yours uh, thanks a lot for these uh, kind words and i hope you can all see my screen is that okay yes, we can. yeah very good and it's also a pleasure to speak here at this Dutch Israeli mini symposium. Actually, my first international project was also with uh, people from Israel, partners from Israel, also the Amal group and Accent. Uh, so it's really a pleasure to talk here again. Uh, and also an invitation to work in European projects. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit. Yeah. You can put it in presentation mode, then uh, it will be even better. Okay, well, let me see. That is great. Okay, very good. Uh, yeah, so today, today I'm going to talk a little bit about general technology in dementia care. I will also present a lot of examples from projects that we are doing, and also some of the market failures that we see in the Netherlands. So, so why, why is it not going that fast? Um, well, first, uh, at Freelance, um, we have about 40 uh, colleagues working on digital care projects, also a lot on dementia projects. Um, we do about 43 uh, of those projects, um, also large um, uh, implementation and upscaling projects in the Netherlands, where we also coach care organizations uh, in long-term care. And what we think is important is that you always should iteratively co-design, uh, do value-based research, but also support data-driven care. So the end users, we see them as a crucial success factor in the design. So and uh, also with people with dementia. Um, it should always add the value to the lives of people, so not a technology push. Um, and we really are in favor now of uh, focusing on uh, data uh, and, and big data and AI, uh, really to support precision health. 
Well, if you look at how we work, um, we always work out of needs analysis, a tryout, intuitive design. And so really based on, on what people need <laughs> and, and not, not, not the technology push. Um, and we work actually down uh, to the bottom. And what is really important also is that we focus on transformation of care. So it's not just adding technologies to care processes, but also transforming the way people work. Now we'll give an example later on. Um, yeah, this also means that the way we work, it's not predictable. <laughs> if, if it would be 100% predictability, it would be 0% innovation. And again, value delivery be, is, is far more important than plan fulfillment. Uh, what, what we know, of course, is that people who age uh, differ a lot. Some people need some support. Uh, some people are still DJs. Uh, some people uh, develop a care for care program in the UK, up to people who need 24 hour care in close proximity. Uh, and what we know from uh, some old textbooks this is the way how we looked at aging, uh, that with aging, for example, word scores decline. Uh, if you look at the actual data, it is, it's the trend line, but of course there are also a lot of people who age who are still able to uh, uh, have the same performance as, as, as young adults. But again, there's a large group that also needs some support and also with technologies. Uh, what we do in design processes is that we always take into account the technology generation that people are from. Uh, so we know that most of the baby boomers, they're from um, uh, the, the older technology generations, elect electromechanical generations. So when you design, take into account uh, the, the, the technologies that they have worked with. Well, we see, of course, a large urgency also in the Netherlands and worldwide. Uh, people are aging, uh, fertility rates are dropping. Uh, I just heard that in the Netherlands, due to COVID, it, 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 it's not dropping that fast. <laughs> um, and what we also see in particular in the Netherlands is that we have huge shortages of care professionals. And then if you look at uh, the people, um, uh, the, the students in, in care, uh, only 4% chooses elderly care. So most of the students want to go to hospitals. So youth shortages and in the Netherlands it's about 100,000 right now and, and it's everly increasing. So yeah, we really need to look into technologies and how they can support care, also dementia care, uh, to support independent living, uh, living at home, uh, to support, for example, the dementia client journey, uh, but also to support the informal care with working life, which is an important one too. And of course, the work efficiency of the formal care is because we have those shortages. Well, if you look at the, the failures and the uptake, at least in the Netherlands, of, of e-health, uh, I've been part of the e-health monitor in the Netherlands from 2014 to 2019. And what we saw there uh, is that there are some increases, and also during COVID, we received, of course, an increase in screen-to-screen -screen care, uh, some uh, advancements in electronic patient records, uh, double check of medication, medication dispensers. However, it's still very slow. And what we found in this monitor is that, well, ELF is not always plug and play. Um, uh, the needs or the benefits are still somewhat unclear. So that really also focuses on, on, on co-design and that we need to do that right. Uh, the cost effectiveness is unclear. So we need to focus on that too. Um, we need to create awareness. Um, and this is also an interesting one. People still experience insufficient added value. So if you look at the design process and let's say also the pre-design processes, and we really need to work on adding that value to really know what, what the needs are. Um, well, we, we did, we did a, a, a literature research study uh, where we studied uh, in, in which phases people with dementia are included. Uh, and what we found is that people with dementia are mainly involved in the generative phase of, of design and in the evaluative phase of design, but not in the pre-design phase where you really try to gain insight into where are the needs, but also post-design, so also upscaling and, and, and the business. Well, I want to uh, present some um, projects that we are doing uh, also uh, within Europe, within the AL program, Active and Assisted Low, uh, Living program. And what is really nice to think about this program, but I'm looking forward to the, to the new ones also with Israel, is that it's really focusing also on the business side. So um, it's really important that SMEs are involved. Um, it's really open innovation, so also with care organizations, with uh, universities, knowledge institutes, etc., uh, to, to develop products and services that match the needs. Well, some examples, this is a nice one uh, I'm coordinating from Vlands right now. It's the HAL project. Uh, and what we're doing here is that we 
um, focus on a bundle of care technologies that have already been developed uh, for the market, also for people with dementia and the informal carers. And we want to support, let's say, the client journey over the different phases of dementia. Uh, we're not going to develop these products again, or we're not going to enhance them. Uh, but the new thing about it is that we will develop an AI-based platform, so a dashboard for care professionals. And the dashboard uses, uh, let's say, all the sensor data from these different devices. And hopefully uh, to, to, to support quality of life, uh, but also for prevention, for example. Another example is the eWeb project. Uh, we just finished this one. Um, and the nice thing here is that we focus also on two existing technologies. Uh, one is a social robot, uh, Tessa, and the other technology is lifestyle monitoring. And what we did here is that, well, most of the social robots are not that smart. <laughs> they're, they're more like digital clocks. Uh, and we wanted to make that robot a little bit smarter. So we connected it to uh, a sensor network in the home uh, so that the robot could provide context relevant messages. And the nice thing for the sensors was that they got an interface uh, to the person with dementia via the robot. Um, from the last evaluation we did, and we did it about we have 60 people with dementia uh, across Europe, and we found that for more than 10% of the end users, this combination had a positive impact, which was really nice. So it, the combination supported, for example, medication intake. So for the reminders, uh, it supported uh, social interactions, um, um, uh, but also, for example, taking your lunch, etc. So we, we found some interesting uh, positive findings by means of this combination, and hopefully we can carry on with similar projects like this. Uh, another one that we are doing right now is, is, is Guardian. Uh, here we're also developing um, a, a robot, but this one is a little bit more advanced. And the nice thing about this robot is, is that it can really um, uh, monitor uh, also emotional well-being, for example. It has a lot more sensors. Uh, it can also navigate through the house, uh, also to support as a social companion. And hopefully next year, uh, depending on COVID, of course, but we, could, we can evaluate it large scale uh, across Europe. Another example I want to share is, is, is Freewalker. Um, uh, the nice thing about this project is that we really focused on mobility. So increasing, let's say, the movement of space uh, for people with dementia. Um, what we have right now mostly on the market, if you look at GPS trackers, they have static life circles. So that means that you cross the life circle and an alarm will be raised. However, our lives are, of course, not static. Uh, they are dy dynamic. It can be the case that you have a lunch with maybe your daughter or you have an appointment at the doctor. Uh, it can be the case that you have some physical problems during the day uh, that, well, your movement of space is, is, is lower. So we actually made also AI-based uh, a dynamic life circle for people with dementia to increase uh, mobility. And we just finished uh, some of the evaluation. And hopefully in the next talk, I can share some of the results. And this is all a lot about uh, monitoring, uh, about observations, etc. And of course, we also need to focus more on, let's say, the positive side of life. Uh, by means of entertainment uh, and activation products also. Uh, this is also what we're doing. And uh, in, in one of the projects, we just also finished um, a postcard. We actually developed a serious game for uh, informal carers, uh, how to deal with difficult situations of people with dementia. So it also used a lot of knowledge from observations, from science. Um, and what you can actually do is so you can practice in this game uh, how to deal with difficult situations. And we made a simple 2D version of this game right now and also offered it via freelance for free uh, where people can actually practice uh, these. And we, we got some positive results from the informal carers. Yeah, we're doing, of course, a lot with data and, and Bynot also already talked about it. Of course, we also need to do this responsibly. So responsible AI, responsible innovation, really need to focus on, let's say, privacy issues, transparency, uh, diversity, inclusion, etc. Because everything that we are doing will have a huge impact on the lives of people. So we should develop that responsibly. Well, finally, I want to close with um, something that we do on, on let's say, value-based um, care. Um, uh, I choose this example because we, we got most, uh, most data out of this study. It was a two-year study on smart diapers, where you would say, well, why do you need smart diapers? Um, uh, well, smart diapers really can uh, decrease the, the workload of care professionals um, because it takes a lot of time to uh, change uh, diapers to do incontinence care. And it's also a little bit privacy intrusive. So uh, a lot of unnecessary checks are there, unnecessary cleanings. 
Uh, so what we did, we followed um, more than seven care organizations um, during a two-year uh, project. Uh, we observed 143 clients with a lot of measurements, interviews, etc., uh, to come up with a cost-benefit analysis. And what we found for this particular technology uh, is that it can actually save nine hours per day per location. So that it's almost one FTE. Um, we also did a macro calculation. So what could it mean for the Netherlands? Uh, well, it could save, uh, uh, it's a huge workload reduction actually. It, it's not enough yet, but if, if we combine everything and we work smarter with them, um, it, it could actually mean a lot. Um, well, that's just the timing, but of course, most importantly to enhance quality of care, of course, it is also we, what we found is that there's better night rest and sleep uh, among the clients. And we saw a reduction in unnecessary cleaning, which is also important, of course, if you look at the privacy aspects, reduction in wet beds, et cetera. So quite some nice uh, results. And we, we actually do this now for many, many of these types of technologies. Well, we see three large themes for the future to focus on, or maybe also methods. So very important, the co-design. So how to do this right with people with dementia, to really include them in that design, also in the pre-design phase. And really want to focus on value-based digital healthcare. So how to really validate uh, all the care technologies. And it is important because we need to finance them. And also in the Netherlands, I mean, if you look at the, the financing healthcare insurers, um, we want to have sufficient proof so that they will finance it. And of course, data driven care. So how can we use data from all those devices uh, to enhance also personalized care? So this was my uh, presentation and uh, thanks a lot for listening. Thank you so much, Hank, for your presentation and uh, also uh, for showing us that you are engaged in so many EU projects. Um, and as uh, this is one of the ways to fund any collaboration between Israel and the Netherlands, I yeah. hope that you will have in your next presentation, as you mentioned, also some consortia in which there are also Israeli uh, partners. Yeah, very um, good, thanks. Yeah, now I'd like to introduce our uh, next speaker, Professor Shacha Arzi. But this is actually not the, the first time that uh, that Shahar is um, presenting in the framework of a Jane meeting. This will be his second time uh, because Shahar has already been uh, engaged in, uh, I would say, multiple discussions with the Netherlands, and he serves as an example uh, for the uh, possible collaboration between Israel and the Netherlands in the field of AI and dementia. So this is very good and I hope that uh, the project that you're currently working on will materialize and this will be an example of many more to follow. Professor Shacha Arzi from the Computational Neuropsychiatry Lab from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem um, is a researcher in cognitive uh, neurosciences and a board certified clinical neurologist. He specializes in cognitive behavioral neurology and neuropsychiatry with particular interest in Alzheimer's diseases. He established the Computational Neuropsychiatry Lab at the Hebrew University in the year 2012, the Neuropsychiatry Clinic at the Hadassah Medical Center in 2013, and the Brain Health Neurocognitive Clinic at Hadassah Medical Center in 2020. His research established the importance of spatial, temporal, and social cognition in Alzheimer's disease by identifying the responsibility, the responsible brain system, its deviation along the AV continuum, as well as most interesting phenomenon of the interrelations between the system, the system and the memory system. He also uh, developed CLARA, a human-like artificial intelligence AI system for early diagnosis of preclinical Alzheimer's disease. And uh, Shachal, you will tell us uh, about using AI to rethink our approach to Alzheimer's disease. The floor is yours. Yeah. Um, thank you, Rachel. You can hear me and see everything well? Yes. Yeah, good. So, um, so thank you. And it's really exciting to be here with uh, uh, this framework that just uh, uh, came up. And um, in the 10, 15 minutes that I have, I would like to um, uh, uh, present uh, the probabilistic approach to Alzheimer's disease. And uh, that I, th I think may be of uh, interest for, 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 for you and our uh, humble uh, efforts uh, within this, uh, this framework. And of course, we feel free to ask, uh, uh, to ask questions uh, during the presentation as much as 
you feel like. Um, so I uh, like to start with uh, this slide that I made about the ping pong in between uh, the definition of Alzheimer's disease uh, in the in the U.S. Uh, National uh, Institute of Health and of Aging and uh, the reaction by the International Working Group uh, led by uh, Bruno Dubois from the Salpetriere. Um, at um, 84, the NIH put the criteria for, for Alzheimer's disease uh, were all clinical criteria, and um, we had to recite them uh, by heart uh, for the clinician here, like uh, David. And I'm like, how many times we had to, we had to, to, to remember all this by heart and then to forget them again because they are not useful. But it was like a tables of tables of tables. You remember this? <laughs> and then at 2007, 20, more than 20 years later, um, came the International Working Group. And then they said, well, you can't say like a psychiatrist that um, there, are, there are so many criteria. Um, um, let's say that Alzheimer's is a memory disorder and specifically episodic memory. Don't rely on the minimental that uh, is really uh, very, very limited and put inside um, the, the uh, real biomarker. Um, soon after, uh, so the NIH experts had to gather together and say, no, no, the minimalism is important. Memory, okay, fine. Let's say memory plus because it's not only memory and they are right. As for the biomarker, they say it may increase certainty. And they just came back from CEOs years at Harvard. So I learned that may increase certainty if we translate it to European languages means, well, um, good, fine, uh, but uh, don't bother me with nonsense. Um, and uh, then at 2014, uh, the, so Bruno Dubois and friends uh, reacted back. They said, well, you are right for the memory, so let's call it typically deemed. A typical idea, a very important seed for the definition of the phenotypes of Alzheimer's disease, but you should put the, the uh, significant uh, biomarkers of PET tau, PET amyloid inside. And then in 2018, a miracle, the NIA group forgot about all their efforts by, to, to do a clinical phenotypic definition, and they just rely on, on amyloid and tau and neurodegeneration. What happened? We don't know, but we know that uh, the drugs against amyloid and, uh, and tau uh, came up, and, and they are really uh, good in, uh, in, in removing the, the, the amyloid and tau. They are less good in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in affecting the neuropsychology outcome of the patients. So recently, as the International Working Group, again, uh, led by Dubois, and, and again, uh, published in, in the Lancet Neurology, they said, well, as for uh, the minimental, out, we agree. Cognition, uh, we should have specific phenotypes, and we should need as well positive biomarkers, but you cannot take out the clinics from the disease or the clinics from the clinician. Like in, in, in neurology, and especially in, 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 in psychiatry or neuropsychiatry or eye work in the border in between the two, the clinics, the phenomenology is the essence of the disease. You can't just rely on biomarkers, it's unhealthy. Um, Soon after, um, uh, Dubois and, uh, and Group also, uh, also published a prospective paper in uh, Nature uh, Reviews and Neuroscience, which was a very recent paper. When they said that uh, 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 loud and clear against the amyloid hypothesis, and they put the probabilistic model, uh, model of Alzheimer's. Um, in a nutshell, instead of the, the, the amyloid hypothesis uh, uh, posted by, by uh, Denis Selko at 82 already and governed uh, the domain of Alzheimer's disease for, for, for uh, 40, more than 40 years, um, instead of like a chain of events, starts with the a, a, a main devil of, uh, of amyloid and then a cascade that goes from one to another to the full-blown Alzheimer's disease, they say, well, there, is, uh, uh, there are very, uh, uh, very many factors. There, there is the, the role of amyloid and tau, no doubt about it, but there are low risk genes and there are very many uh, 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 risk factors that when uh, too many of them accumulate together, together with the tau and the amyloid, it gives rise to Alzheimer's disease. And this uh, approach, though it's less elegant, it solves very many problems that uh, arise during the, the, the course of, um, of, of uh, Alzheimer's of clinical, clinical uh, investigation and, 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 basic, and basic scientific. Um, in a nutshell, uh, the, the, the amyloid hypothesis uh, 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 explains very well the clinics of people with 
ADAD, autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, but this is less than 1% of the, of the population, more, more than 99% uh, don't have the autosomal dominant. So uh, the, the, the hypothesis cannot account for, uh, for, most, of the, for, for, for most of the clinical manifestation. Mm. So uh, we spoke about, uh, about the phenotypes of Alzheimer's and the in, important of risk factors. As for the phenotypes, there are two phenotypes that are uh, marginal and very well known. One is posterior cortical atrophy. It involves visual impairment and a logophenic uh, Alzheimer's disease, which involve uh, um, mostly uh, speech uh, uh, production. However, um, mm, there are the main, the main uh, phenotypes, so they are not well defined. They are called executive and or, or, or limbic and MTL sparing, but they are yet to be defined. As for the, um, for, for the, uh, for the risk factors, um, there is one good study um, that was published on, a, on, on only 400 patients from the Mayo Clinic in, in, uh, in Minnesota uh, for local people there. And they, but the, 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 the effort was led not by a clinician. Um, the clinician of the, of the Mayo Clinic was, of course, there, but, the, but, but, but the, 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 the lead of the study was a professor from New Mexico, uh, Pankratz, uh, which uh, introduced a, a very effective uh, computational model of the uh, Cox Hazard predictive model and really uh, managed to take some of the risk factors that we all uh, know and grade them accordingly uh, to, according to, to importance. Because instead of like doing a copy paste of uh, some of the of some of the factors, now you can uh, really say what is more important, what is less important, and make your patient uh, uh, um, follow at least some of your recommendations that otherwise they won't do. So what it, we want to do using AI is actually <coughs> tackling these two efforts. One is to define the, uh, uh, the phenotypes of Alzheimer's disease, not the two that are known, but the two that are not known, and also uh, um, tailor a personalized uh, program to, of modifiable risk factors to the individual patient. How do we do that? So first, and I don't have time to explain how and why, but it's explain, so I explain what. We define Alzheimer's as a disorientation disorder, like it's based on the clinical and neuroimaging studies. Uh, um, so we, we could define that as a, that the, the, the important function of orientation, which should be examined in every patient which comes to the, to the clinic or to the emergency room. That's the first thing that one has to ask if is or or she is oriented in space and time and self and person. Um, and this is like, uh, as you see here, like the relation between the person to the environment around, to life events, and to, the social, to, to his or her social networks. And one of the striking uh, phenomena in Alzheimer's disease is patients that are still functioning, they are still uh, have their grace, but they don't remember their own grandchildren, which is terrifying. Um, so the problem is that if, uh, un unlike other neuropsychological tests, we cannot just uh, uh, put stimuli and, 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 and do it in a digital manner, because we have to know the patient. If I want to ask the patient about events from his or her own life, about his or her friends and family, so I have to know them. Um, so we have a, 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 in, in, so we established Clara, which is an, a, an, an eye chatbot that interviews the patient and uh, in a human-like manner and gather information. And then we do a short test and we just ask the patient who is closer to you or what place is closer to you, what event is closer to you. And we measure the action time, error rates, and uh, as usual. And what's it you can see here very briefly, like from all these graphs, I will show you uh, in, in panel B, you see the, the prediction accuracy. And you see this prediction accuracy with respect here to clinical diagnosis by, the, uh, by, our, uh, by Clara, by the orientation task uh, that is done automatically is 95%. How we calculate it, we calculate the logistic regression. Here you have the percentage that, uh, that, uh, that, that we are right, and then and, and the threshold that uh, calculates the accuracy. And we do, this, we do the same for other tests, like for example, the Adenbrook cognitive assessment that is a, a long no psychological battery and more. And you see that the prediction accuracy of Clara is very high. You also see that if we follow up the patient after one year, you see that here, patient with Alzheimer's, you see that they accumulate in the highest uh, probability uh, as, uh, as, as evaluated by, 
uh, uh, by Clara. Um, for experts, I also show that the person domain is more resilient than, and you see problem in a person domain only at the uh, end of the disease in the transformation from MCI to Alzheimer's, while the space and time domains are uh, seen already early in the, in the disease. Now, um, in order to evaluate Clara better, we uh, collaborated with uh, 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 my friend, uh, Professor Gad Marshall, the head of clinical trials in Harvard Medical School and the Mass General uh, uh, Brigham Hospital. And there they do, uh, they have the ability to do a pet tau, which we don't have in Israel, and also it's very costly. So they have patients, and the patients are, are, are undergoing a full evaluation, including pet tau and including pet amyloid and MRI and, 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 and many more. And they also do our, uh, uh, our own cloud test. Now, um, if we, uh, so, so, so we are uh, supposing to have uh, 300 patients um, and we already recruited as, uh, 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 as uh, 50 of them and 30, uh, as around 30 already did the, the, did the tau, the pet tau. But that you see here on the y axis, is the uh, is, is is a level of pet tau? What you see here is the Clara score. So if we uh, if we look at the at the different uh, uh, quadrants here, so you see uh, here you see uh, the people that that, that uh, uh, you see the score of Clara. So let's say that these people uh, that this half Clara uh, identified as positive from four and above, and this is a tau. So this. Uh, four or five people um, are, are are defined as having as as as, as having a, a preclinical Alzheimer's disease. I didn't tell you that this is these are just the controls. These are just the, the, the these are not the, the people with the MCI and the people with uh, with Alzheimer's that both Clara and the biomarkers identify. These are patients with uh, that are cognitively normal and their neuropsychology is also normal. Nevertheless, they have a high tau and they also have a high a, a high score of Clara. And you see that Clara is able to identify all people who have high tau. There is a false positive here, not false positive, we don't know, but uh, for a screening test to have a false positive, it's not a problem. The problem is to have to have a false negative and false negative, we don't have it all. Um, and as you see, if you compare Clara in a repetitive people who did it already twice and then in a repetitive manner, so you see that the performance of Clara is much higher than uh, the minimental and then even than the CDR, which is like uh, quite of a gold standard. So this is a fresh, fresh from the oven result that we just got uh, a week ago, and we hope that uh, uh, there are only uh, four of five, five patients here, but it's all four of five patients that uh, uh, that got this uh, high high tau, and I hope that uh, when we uh, have more more people here, actually, they're not patients, they're people because they're going to be normal, it will be the same. Um, Two more things. One thing is um, that we do it also under fMRI, and this is under PET fMRI, so we can get a signature, a brain signature uh, of the orientation uh, and disorientation in Alzheimer's. And then what we can do is we do an orientation performance and we, do, and we have the brain signature. So from the brain signature, we can go, and that's what we do to, to our data and to, and, and to databases, and then look for modifiable risk factors and, and also adjust the modifiable risk factors to the brain signature of orientation in the individual patient level. And then if people do start to uh, uh, um, uh, go to, uh, um, to, to follow them as the modifiable risk factors, so they can also affect uh, disease progression. And you know it's 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 a, it's a sim, it's a simple thing, but nevertheless people are not are not are not aware of them. Uh, like for example, oral hygiene. And um, if you are uh, have, have a high score, so instead of telling the patient, okay, you have a high score, you are so you are prone to 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 uh, develop Alzheimer's disease. So what we uh, <coughs> sorry we should say to the patient is, well, go to an oral hygienist. <coughs> sorry. Like um, uh, um, three times a year. Um, so this is a, a WhatsApp we developed together with uh, with uh, Hans and uh, Jane, and this is a Clara second generation. And here you see you interview the patient for the orientation disorder. We do a, a, a personal a personal questionnaire about 
things that are important to the modifiable risk factors but are less maybe uh, less well known by the clinicians and then we can provide a personalized uh, recommendation to the individual patient according to his or her clinical stage and according to his or her clinical profile and our algorithms that uh, adjust uh, modifiable risk factors to the profiles of these patients. And last slide, which I'm more, most proud of, is how people are already use Clara around the world. And uh, since it's uh, so easy to use, it's free and it's on a, it's a, it's on a phone or a tablet or, or a computer. And here is a group of people in uh, Brazil who promote it in, uh, in Brazil, in, in, in the Amazonas region. Here it's in China, in Boston. And um, uh, um, I do uh, thank all of the people who are involved in, uh, in creating this. And the conclusion is that, uh, that disorientation is a major Alzheimer's disease phenotype. Disorientation may be diagnosed early through Clara. Uh, as in classical medicine, Alzheimer's disease is a multifactorial disorder, and treatment of such factors should keep Alzheimer's disease below the threshold. Uh, thank you, and uh, I would be happy also to take questions if there are. Thank you, Shahal, um, for your presentation. We will take quick, uh, we will take uh, questions during the uh, discussion after our last speaker. Um, I heard you say during your presentation that in Israel there is no pet tau uh, technology, um, and therefore I referred you to our next uh, Dutch Israeli mini symposium, which will take place on the 22nd of February 2022. And that uh, mini symposium will focus on AI and radiology. And maybe it is interesting, so far we have only linked two subjects, so in this case, AI and dementia in our mini symposia, but here we could add another level and that is also add the technology um, to a mini symposium. In any case, you're invited uh, to uh, attend that mini symposium. And if you feel that there is room to have a mini symposium, which is focused on the technology that is needed to further the research in the field of AI and dementia, um, you can turn to me. I'd like to now introduce our last speaker, um, uh, Fokko van der Woude, who is an entrepreneur and a co-founder of Kuloba, which is a Dutch company. He works on a mission to enable people to use their memory for as long as possible. In 2013, Foco developed a solution that prevented people suffering uh, from dementia from leaving their house. He specializes in creating effective and user-centered solutions and currently works on a novel way of cognitive training. And Foco, you will tell us more about the challenges to overcome in delivering new products. The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, Alain. Um... I'll share my screen though. It's easy, right? Oh, let me check. Just in presentation mode. Yeah. It isn't yet. I cannot see what you see. Can you see the presentation now? Or can now we see your desktop. Oh really? Oh wow. <laughs> so this should this is it right then yeah, yeah that's great all right thanks yeah working on two screens so uh yeah thing is we're all the way on the last one now so yeah this is better yeah thanks you uh thanks 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 for your invitation um thanks for the introduction uh, as well my name is uh Foco van der Wouden um uh, one of the founders of uh, of uh, Tuluba, um, as you said in your introduction as well, uh, we're one of the, the few companies uh, uh, here today. Um, yeah, our mission, um, the the thing what, what we're focusing on is uh, is having people using their memory uh, as long as possible. So uh, our background is is or my background. Uh, is uh, I, I've been an entrepreneur for almost all my life, and um, 
especially the last few years, uh, we've come to the inside. We wanted to dedicate the time we have to to something that that is important. And uh, I've had some uh, uh, cases cases of memory loss within my family, so that made me and uh, my companion focus on 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 yeah, pff, saying making the world a, a better place. And uh, uh, the thing that we focus on is uh, building solutions that people really use. So we see there's an enormous ecosystem of, um, of scientists, uh, research centers, um, uh, and, and, and what we bring to the table here is uh, we've always focused on building solutions that people really use. So one of the things that we did, I think yeah, back in 2013, I guess, um, was develop a door sticker uh, so that people in, in care homes wouldn't recognize a door as a door anymore, but they thought it, of it as a, as a bookcase um, that decreased uh, the numbers of people running away with about, I think, 80 80 percent or something. So it's not that for us, it wasn't about the, the, the technical innovation. It wasn't about um, it, it wasn't about the, the difficulty, but making it as easy as possible and, and, and building things that really work and people can uh, use uh, easily. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, about Tuluba. Um, within Tuluba, we have three uh, three main products. Um, the first one is our uh, compensatory memory training. Um, it focuses merely on um, people with uh, suffering subjective cognitive decline. Uh, the reason we do this because it is that we wanted to do something within the most early stage of uh, memory loss. I think most people recognize that when you're in, in the domain of dementia, it's a lot about a quality of life that, that is important. You also wanted to do something that, that enables people to, uh, to really uh, improve. So uh, what we work on here is uh, compensatory memory training. Uh, maybe uh, most of you are familiar with it, but it actually teaches you different ways to remember things better. Things are, uh, it's a scientifically proven method that has also been used by the, the world champions in uh, memory training and memory uh, games. And uh, what we're doing is that we uh, make this uh, accessible for uh, for everyone uh, with, with a simple training program that that already has proven that it really uh, it really works. Um, our uh, our other product is Tuluba uh, Remember. Uh, we recently won uh, the Jane Award with it. Tuluba Remember is um, an algorithm that selects the right picture to give back uh, memories to people suffering dementia. Uh, to enable their, their, their well-being. So basically what we did there is I used to do this with my grandma uh, years back. Um, so and then I noticed that whenever I showed her certain images, they tended to work better than, than other images. So certain images made her feel uh, good, made her feel comfortable, gave her more energy. And, and certain images of which I thought that would work as well didn't work at all. So um, we did uh, a small research, uh, 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 did a pilot in in Australia with uh, people that immigrated from Holland to Australia. I think in the in the 50s or 60s, and most of them are at an age they are uh, suffering from dementia now. And what we tried there. Uh, was the same thing I did with my grandma. We didn't know them, but we showed them pictures to see, okay, uh, what gives back good memories uh, or, or what what images uh, don't have an effect at all. And we found out that there are specific things to certain images that give back uh, memories and uh, enable people to have a better day, but also give back energy. And then yeah, what we saw there were the most amazing uh, facts, like people uh getting back memories that haven't been heard by their uh by their nurses for for four or five years uh for instance so we tended to put that into an algorithm uh which we work on um to determine what what's the best possible uh, image that can be shown automatically to someone to uh, to improve uh their their well-being um the third product we uh, we have is uh CCOZ. 
SQLZ is a data management uh, uh, program, specializes in, in optimal engagement um, uh, for uh, for uh, for people attending in in uh, in uh, in research, especially uh, cognitive research. So uh, it works with an app uh, that people can use for easily um, uh, implement their uh, their data uh, and uh, do questionnaires with uh, to get an optimal of your of your uh, research data. Um, a little bit more about the, about the training program that, that we work on uh, exists of three uh, different modules. Um, the first one, I think, um, is really interesting. Uh, also, uh, after the presentations of uh, Wijnand and, uh, and Shahar, um, because it's merely um, it's a baseline test. So um, the first part exists of test, analyze and monitoring uh, before attending to the training program. Um, we want to give people insight in, in the baseline test also to be shared, preferably with, uh, uh, with a GP, for instance. Um, so one of the things that we work on with, um, uh, with, with Boris is in a board of advisors and researchers as well, is uh, how can we do uh, an accessible uh, baseline test of cognitive functioning that gives people an indication of where they are at, um, and that data over time might also um, uh, have, have predictive uh, uh, values. Um, but the baseline also helps us to, the, the AI uh, behind it helps also to address the right training um, uh, after you fill it in. So um, the second part is the information memory education. Uh, it's all about having lifestyle tips. So how can you, how, how, what can you do uh, to optimize your cognitive functioning? Uh, it's part of psychoeducation because one of the main things uh, is uh, to help people deal with uh, their cognitive decline. Uh, make sure uh, they get the optimum amount of, of their day. Uh, that they feel better, uh, lower anxiety and stress um, because that's a thing that, that, that can be done easier because um, one of the things that we saw is as long as you're not, uh, as it, it doesn't look like you're uh, suffering dementia or, or on the way to become uh, a dementia patient, then there's, there's very little care, but there's a lot of anxiety and stress for people. So uh, that's the gap we fill in here. And uh, the third part is the, the gamified memory strategy specific for memory uh, trainings. So it's a compensatory training training your memory to work in a different way to remember things better specifically in daily life uh, because that that's what we're uh, that's what we're focusing on uh, so people can function better in uh, in uh, daily life well uh, one of the one of the challenges we have and i think also why we are uh, here um, is they are setting up a reliable easy to use baseline uh, a test so we know there's EEG and, and, and there's different methods that are pretty um, uh, pretty hard to take, take a lot of time or, or effort. Um, what we're looking at is developing uh, easy to use baseline tests, preferably from home people, uh, especially now with, with COVID, that people don't have to leave their homes. Um, so I think, Shahar, uh, that I, I really liked your, your presentation with Clara as well, because that could be one of the things that uh, that we collaborate on uh, easily. So um, yeah, the same uh, this data because we're in an early stage of people uh, suffering uh, um, subjective cognitive decline. As I said, it's it's about 20, 15 to 20 percent of all the people uh, of uh, 65 years and older. Uh, this data will probably uh, provide valuable insights in the in the long term. A little bit. Uh, who do we work with? Since yeah, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not a. I, I'm definitely not a scientist. So um, uh, yeah, we like to, uh, to to work together with scientists because I think entrepreneurship uh, and science um, are, are are a perfect uh, are, are a perfect mix of getting getting things uh, done. So um, the, we work together with Felix Research, who initially. Um, uh, build the uh, training up to a research prototype uh, after which we uh, elaborate on it. Um, 
after the Jane challenge, we got off the collaboration with uh, Philons. So we spoke with uh, Hank Herman uh, uh, a few times, and, uh, and and especially I think what's interesting is in, in effect management, uh, effect measurement, and uh, and uh, knowledge and measuring effect of uh, of the training, for instance, uh, also helps us to um, connect uh, healthcare, for instance. And I think that that's important uh, outcome of any uh, of any project. Um, uh, Rabot University, uh, we're located in, uh, in Nijmegen, so we're closely related to there. Um, we got a knowledge agreement with the RISE Research Institute of, uh, of uh, Sweden about front-end interaction with uh, users. And uh, um, yeah, as an entrepreneur, we also look uh, further along the line. Um, so uh, we partnered up with Philips Vital, Hair, uh, Vital Health, um, especially for data distribution in care. Um, and that's merely about the value of the data that is coming out in, in, uh, in, in like in the real world. Um, so a little bit about the team then. I think it's merely uh, the, the founders. Uh, I told a little bit about myself. I work together with uh, Anton Arendt, who all have merely an entrepreneurial background. And, uh, but since we are no, uh, no scientists, we have scientific advisory uh, Panel. I think uh, it, most interesting here is also uh, Boris. Boris Komrat uh, is uh, he's a researcher specialized in memory, but he's also a eight-time world champion in uh, in uh, memory games. So he's he's really an expert in how how to apply memory uh, memory strategies in the real life. And uh, so we're, uh, uh, we're we're happy with all of our scientific uh, uh, advisory, but. Uh, especially uh, with borders, um, implementing, helping us to implement in the real world and, and getting the maximum out of the training is, is a really interesting combination, I think. So um, this was a presentation. Um, thanks for your attention. And uh, I, uh, I understand questions will be, uh, will be there in a minute since I'm the last one, I think. But uh, so thanks for your uh, attention. And uh, please get in touch if you want to know anything or uh, or seeing any opportunities, of course. Thank you so much, Foco. And yes, indeed, you were the last uh, presenter. And after we finish our uh, mini symposium, I will also share with you the presentations uh, so that you can have another look at the presentations and you'll have the contacts of the people that presented. Uh, Hans, if you can lead now uh, our discussion, uh, that would be great. Yeah, my first question is for Marco. Is Marco available in the meeting? I don't it's see him. Yeah. Hi, Marco. Um, you're a specialist in the needs of people of uh, Alzheimer. Um, could you say something about the specific needs? And how could we support them with application? Uh, we have made some studies. Maybe you can say something about that. Well, well the, the common thing is that there's a great variety in needs of people with dementia and carers, um, but that, that's maybe not the, the answer you want for your question. So um, what, what we should be um, aware of is that people with dementia have a more or less different setup of needs, more around well-being and being uh, socially active and maintaining uh, their autonomy, for instance. Um, whereas uh, in a, on a general level, caregivers are more interested in, in the health-related uh, and care-related aspects. And one of the things that you see is that, for instance, um, with, with uh, a solution concerning mobility, uh, persons with dementia like these uh, solutions to make them more uh, active in the society. And uh, carers are... Uh, well, they're having their problems with wandering behavior and, and keeping people not going too far away from home. So sometimes these uh, needs are more or less uh, 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 quite different from each other. But, 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 they, but what they have in common is that both the carers and the parents with, uh, with dementia want to stay at home as long as possible with a good quality of life. And, and but underneath this are quite set up of different needs for caregivers and patients. Okay, this is a wonderful question, uh, answer to my question. And I think this is also a good introduction to Wijnand because here, here they come. 
do we have a dilemma between uh, carriers and staying at home at longer uh, this quality of life why not is this a dilemma give us do it give us uh, design criteria well i fully agree with my what marco just said so, so some of these um needs that are formulated from uh, uh, differ when depending on the perspective with which you're uh, with which you're looking right so if you're looking with a, 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 a perspective of a carer you have you will formulate different needs also on behalf of the person with dementia uh, than if you're looking from the perspective of the person with dementia now there is some overlap um, we did some literature review of what are the needs in these different populations and how are they how are they uh, carved out and um, for instance um, the needs that people with dementia themselves formulate, uh, as, as Marco said, are about social interaction, about meaningful contributions to society, also to, to um, uh, address some of the emptiness that they sometimes may feel, uh, to stay uh, um, autonomous for, uh, to a large extent. Um, whereas from, from people around the person with dementia, there's also this need to have peace of mind, to know that the person is safe and secure, that they're cared for in a, in a, in a good way. Um, and, and so those are not necessarily at variance with each other, but it is important to realize um, that it, who you're designing for, right? And what, what this, and how this design may embody maybe a multitude of, uh, of, of values in, in design. Yeah, wonderful. Um... I heard the the term uh, anonymy yeah, to be uh, self reliant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, how is it uh, be done in the um, maybe people with dementia are uh, one year before diagnosed dementia and four years behind? How could people uh, stay uh, self-reliant until five years after they've been diagnosed. Do you understand my question? Uh, I think I do. Uh, so uh, I, I, there is, of course, a, a big variation of, let's say, abilities and also needs uh, across the dementia journey. Uh, and, and so the kinds of support that people need early on in the in the um in the dementia journey may be may be limited and may may also have a, a different focus uh so and i think actually when you're looking at ai as a learning technology i think ai can be um maybe less supportive and more sort of uh learning itself sort of to improve its support later on and so i guess there's also room for for uh, a, a developing technology that that follows the the dementia journey and will will kick in more uh, explicitly will you know be more of a, an explicit support um after having learned uh, from the person with dementia as well as the carers around it um you know to, to what extent people have certain needs what are their personal uh, histories what are their preferences etc so you can build sort of personalized profiles uh, that the AI may support a person better when they are less able themselves to to um, to uh, ensure their own autonomy. Yeah, that is a great uh, answer. Thank you very much. I will go over to Janne. Uh, Janne, uh, we, you talk about uh, brain imaging, and uh, is it possible that uh, we have 24/7 real-time brain imaging will assist people by giving them in time, well-being, advice as necessary. Yanni. Yeah, so, so brain imaging uh, with respect to MRI, unfortunately, can't be done 24-7 with having this machine on your head. Uh, it will be just too heavy uh, to carry. Uh, I, I think that, so the brain monitoring, monitoring our brain can, can, can be done in various ways. There are now portable EEG machines that, that can be designed to specific waves in the brain that can be used in order to find alteration in brain activity that might be related to symptoms like depression, like stress, like anxiety, and those can be, can be helpful. Although they are not as specific and not as accurate as an MRI. So I think that with the development of, the, of these devices, EEG-based, uh, could have a lot of new information coming in, but eventually you need the MRI once in a while, not 24 seven, but once, once in a few months in order to see uh, how the brain deteriorated or preserved itself over time. 
Okay, thank you very much. Could uh, somebody reflect on what uh, Janev said? I think um, we have some Apple devices who can monitor my sleep and also my daily rhythm. Uh, could there be an answer for this question for 24 seven real time assistant, uh, Janev? Could it be uh, uh, such a device as uh, the iPhone? Yeah, could be, could be. So I'm not, I'm not much familiar with with such devices that uh, that can monitor through the phone if you're not using it overnight. So it can't, it can't monitor you. But there, there must be some kind of interaction, I, I assume, in order to do some kind of monitoring. It can't be, it can be done passively, or passively it can be done with some kind of device that is attached to your body and probably transmitting information to your to your cellular phone and then transmitting it somewhere to the cloud for for further analysis i think uh, Hans, uh, Hans, i can maybe uh, say something about that as well because i think that there there's some interesting developments going on there as well uh, especially since we all use our mobile phones now I know there are some companies working on um, uh, type behavior. So, so the way you type your messages uh, says, says some things about uh, how your cognitively uh, how your cognitive functions are, are going. So I think that that that's a really interesting uh, development because the algorithm behind there can sense very small changes in in your behavior uh, and, and put it into data. And the same thing goes for speech as well. And, and, and there's so many functions and, and uh, trigger points on a mobile phone that could definitely uh, have value in, in that whole process. But I, I think eventually the, the, the biggest thing is, is to, to, to combine data and, and get new outcomes. But there's definitely uh, things that, that can help uh, monitoring, You're probably not, 20, not for typing 24, 24 seven, of course, you probably need some sleep as well, but uh there's definitely uh, uh things going on there that that, that could help us uh, uh do do some real good monitoring mm -hmm. that, that is a question again to the group maybe i will ask to the total to all the participants um could we imagine that we have ai to determine the rhythm of uh, a specific person could we use ai to yeah to see how the rhythm of a, a, a people with dementia is over day and overnight. Who can answer this question to me? Maybe uh, Hank Herman, you can give an answer for that. Yeah, I, I think we are already doing that on on let's say a small scale. So uh, one of the technologies that I showed is the lifestyle monitoring. Uh, there's an algorithm behind that and what it does, it, it, it learns from the person during a, a learning period of, of about two to three weeks. Uh, and after that, it compares, let's say, the behavior of the person with, with, with that learning period. So there's already some, let's say, small AI in there, but I think we can do a lot more on that. So also the example with the, uh, the different technologies uh, that could be used over the different phases. I think it's really interesting when we combine uh, different sensors to get a better view on the on the person. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, do I, somebody want to reflect on uh, these uh, points from which we have discussed so far? Then I'll go to the next question to David. Uh, David uh, Tanne. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, could uh, brain network integrity changes be a new bio market for uh, dementia? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, dementia is a very late stage of the disease and we're looking for something much earlier. So we can look for mild cognitive impairment and look for subtle cognitive changes and we can see very subtle cognitive changes but perhaps we can look even earlier and look at the changes in the brain uh, uh, function using uh, systems like Delphi or, or alike, which are much more sensitive than just regular EEG because they look on the connections of the brain and the plasticity of the brain and the, the, they show very early changes. So in, 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 I can tell you that as a vascular neurologist, I often see patients 
uh, that come with the stroke and they say that, well, until yesterday I was completely healthy and you see your, their brain and their, they have very severe cerebral small uh, vessel disease, uh, all the infarcts uh, and in MRI you would see very uh, many changes that were uh, gathered over the years. So I think we, uh, this option is to give us a tool to show very early a deviation of normal brain health uh, and, uh, and uh, allowing us to do much better prevention because when we see early signs, we have still an opportunity to intervene and that's very exciting uh, in my regard. Uh, thank you very much, David. That is a good uh, step towards Ashar. Ashar, Ashar has uh, having a field lab here in the Netherlands and uh, especially on this part of dementia, he would like to determine the suspicion to be uh, to become Alzheimer's in an early stage. Maybe you can tell something about our field lab in Rotterdam, Shahar. Uh, yeah, the idea is uh, to, to, to try it as a uh, class second generation. Uh, in a large scale, and that's what we um, uh, uh, intended to do first in Israel and then in Boston. And uh, we are happy to um, to have it in a pilot uh, also in the Netherlands uh, nationwide. And before going nationwide, we will do a pilot in uh, in, uh, in 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 Rotterdam. And this is thanks to Hans and uh, driving all this and uh, like. Uh, Really pushing us to, to do that. We, but actually, you have to tell about it because I I will just uh, supply the, the technology and the data. Uh, you are the you are doing the, the operation. I'm I'm aware of that. Um, I'm the, C, the, the the CSO only on the, on the, on this on this project. You are the CEO, COO, CTO. No, no, just I'm just the facilitator of everything, but. Not the uh, CAO, certainly not. But uh, we are trying to set up uh, the project in Rotterdam, which have, uh, we would like to have more projects in the, the Netherlands between Israel and the Netherlands, such as Shahar has initiated. Um, I would like to go back to the questions. Um, Hank Herman uh, mentioned uh, the term market failure, the market failure in the Netherlands, market failure worldwide. Please, uh, could you explain more about your way of thinking about the uh, market failures, please? Um, well, I, I think it's really important that we, we work together more. <laughs> so because, I mean, we're all facing the same challenges and it was also during this mini symposium. I mean, we have aging populations, uh, increasing people with dementia, we have less people to care for them. Uh, so I think it's really about also sharing the knowledge on, on care tech, what works, what doesn't work, and learn from each other. Uh, but also understand the care markets, because I mean, even in the European projects, it's really difficult <laughs> to do the business modeling. I mean, they are so different. Uh, so we need to learn from that. Uh, and also take into account, let's say, more the contextual cultural differences also in design. And AI could hopefully support in that. Um, so yeah, really focus on, let's say, the knowledge, data exchange, uh, but also uh, let the startups work together. Uh, and I see a lot of opportunities also for the Netherlands and Israel, uh, also in validating, let's say, the impact of interventions and support systems that we are developing. So really hope for cooperation on that. Yeah. Oh, that, that is wonderful. But uh, you also mentioned uh, the values, eh? values of people with dementia. Um, I would like to as last question because it's 12 o'clock or uh, it's time to finish but what is in the uh, opinion of all the participants the values of quality of life of people with dementia who would like to try to give the answer i try I, i'll give the word to um leah leah what is the quality of life of people with dementia what are the main values leah Okay, um, um, happy for that question and maybe for the opportunity to also add a few more comments about the things that were presented uh, so far. So just uh, uh, for people who don't know me or, or Amida, 
Um, I'm from uh, Alzheimer's Israel. MDI is a nonprofit uh, here in Israel that helps and supports uh, people with dementia. There are 150,000 people in Israel uh, diagnosed with uh, dementia and probably more, but uh, many don't don't uh, don't get diagnosed. Um, and and we're, when we're talking about the quality of life, um, it's it's tricky because it's it's kind of borderline with the quality of life as they knew it, as it was before, because people uh, need to slowly uh, get used to a different quality of life. But there's a period of time where they're still wanting, wanting to go back to the quality of life as they knew before until they get to some level of acceptance and they just uh, look at things from a new perspective and, and um, consider different things that they can and can't do um, from a different point of view. And what we're talking about um, being able to be independent, I think, uh, first and foremost, uh, can I continue and do the things that I did before myself without the need of someone else because the moment I need someone else to help me then it hurts my quality of life even emotionally because it really mirrors the fact that I am not who I used to be uh, and I need help um, so can I walk by myself can I eat by myself can I drive all the things that I do uh, that slowly um, people can't do anymore um, is is kind of a scale of, of independence and quality uh, of life. Uh, once they they do accept help from other people, whether it's family caregivers or uh, some uh, you know paid help um, from from the outside, then the quality of life is also around the relationship and around another person at home. Um, and, you know, how does it feel for me to be with uh, someone else taking care of me? Sometimes uh, here in Israel, for sure, there is a large community that gets help uh, from the outside and not by family uh, caregivers. So it, it, it also um, speaks to that. And if I, I know we're running out of time, so I just want to throw some comments. Maybe we can discuss them. Um, um, later on, I heard a lot about technologies and research about dementia. I'm interested in, in also knowing and maybe discussing uh, next time, are there differences between the types of dementia? I mean, are these uh, products um, kind of the same for every type of dementia, for every type of age? Meaning here in Israel, we have thousands of people um, younger than 65, and we know that things uh, look different from them. Um, so are these products and research, is it the same for the kind of young onset dementia versus um, the, more, uh, the more elderly? Um, I also want to consider the cultural aspects of uh, these products because um, here in Israel we we design things for a kind of a, a multi multicultural uh, level. We have the Arabic society, uh, ultra orthodox society, different societies that differ diff, diff, um, differ with different characteristics of, of culture. And especially when it comes to technology and not all communities are tech savvy or are equipped um, to, uh, with technology. So I would also consider, um, especially one of you mentioned uh, dementia being in low income. So just technology by a cultural perspective, as well as language, uh, specifically for those technologies that rely on NLP. Um, so many of these uh, products that were mentioned here today, basing on the English uh, language, you know, it won't be able to be adapted here in Israel where we speak Hebrew or Arabic or other languages. So also um, question for how do we um, localize technologies that are uh, language based. Um, I think those are just a few general comments that I think are kind of um, ideas for further discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so happy that you give this uh, answers back to us and this proposal to think about. Uh, Rachel, um, 
May I have uh, one last question or is it too late? I think we should end now. Um, <laughs> It's great that there is more uh, interest, and I suggest that you will contact us, either Hans or myself, or both of us, via email. And uh, if there's room to set up another mini symposium and maybe to set up a conference, um, then we'll do that. So I'd like to thank all the speakers and all the participants, and it was really a very uh, successful uh, mini symposium, and I'm sure we will have uh, more interaction afterwards. Thank, thank you, you very so much. Bye-bye. Bye bye all. Thank you, Amir. Rachel, that was a nice meeting. Thank you very much for my side. If you're unmuted still. Yeah. Uh, when you forget it, it's